Hello, I'm Paul Denieri. I'm a professor of political science at University of California, Riverside, and I'm going to uh, answer a few questions this morning about the war between Russia and Ukraine. Uh, this is a, a project that started with my students asking me a bunch of questions and asking me to produce something that they could share. So thanks to Raja Salmouni, who uh, had the idea and who's provided the questions that I'm going to uh, uh, try to answer. Um, I should say a little bit about my background for those of you who don't know me. I've been studying the Russia-Ukraine conflict really since the end of the Cold War in 1991 and uh, a few years ago wrote this book um, which you can see the title of there, Russia and Ukraine from Civilized Divorce to Uncivil War. Um, the, the title comes from the fact that when the Soviet Union broke up and, and Ukraine uh, peacefully separated from Russia, uh, some people refer to it as a civilized divorce. Um, needless to say, it's gotten a lot less civilized uh, over the years. Um, so let me um, try to answer some questions um, that have been put to me and we'll see where we get in, in, you know, in, the, in the future if there are more questions I can try to produce some more of these videos. So first, um, despite the, the telltale signs and years of buildup, why have uh, actors been slow to stop this war? Uh, there's a bunch of, of reasons, um, but the biggest one is that Russia is a very powerful country. Um, it borders on Ukraine, it has a massive military, and so it's not easy to stop it from doing something it's determined to do. After Russia uh, invaded parts of Ukraine in 2014, seizing Crimea and seizing parts of eastern Ukraine through, through uh, proxies that it supported, uh, there were some sanctions put in place. And a lot of people thought the sanctions were too weak, but the belief, uh, at least at the time, was that this was the fact of the sanctions was sending a strong message to Russia um, that there was a lot of opposition to this. So the idea was to raise the cost of what Russia was doing and hope that that would be enough for Russia to think it's not worth ever doing something like this um, again. Um, there's also a desire in the part of all of the, the countries um, that we're talking about, the United States and its allies in Western Europe in particular, um, not to get involved in a shooting war with Russia. Russia is a country with a massive army and nuclear weapons, and, and uh, nobody thinks that it really is going to fight Russia on the plains of Central Europe, and, and things are going to turn out well. So there's not a desire to actually uh, take on Russia militarily. It could easily escalate into a nuclear war. That would be the end of all of us. Um, there's also, I think, been an, an underestimation, and I'm certainly um, guilty of this, for all of the nasty things that Putin has done over the years, and he's done a lot of them. For all of the nasty things, um, I think a lot of us uh, um, didn't think he would do this. Um, in part because for all the things he's done in the past have seemed uh, sometimes aggressive, sometimes cynical, sometimes even vicious, um, and with no regard for international law, but they've also seemed very careful um, and very risk averse. He's done things that he knew what the results were going to be and, um, and that he, he uh, could control those risks. This is something very different. This is a much riskier undertaking, which is not to say that I think the Ukrainian army is going to last too long against the Russian army. Um, but what happens after that is incredibly uh, hard to predict. War is notoriously hard to predict. And, and if you think about the United States experience in Afghanistan or Iraq, very powerful militaries sometimes uh, end up uh, not getting the results they, they think they're going to get. So that's the part of it that I thought would, would cause him pause. Um, there's also, frankly, we, we, we saw over the last eight years since, since the events of 2014 and now, a real hesitation on the part of a lot of economies, especially in Western Europe, a lot of countries, to really enact strict sanctions on Russia um, because they don't want to hurt their own economies. Uh, Western Europe over the years has become quite dependent on Russian natural gas to power its economy and heat uh, its homes. And, and so, uh, and a lot of people were making a lot of money on it. And so, um, there's been a sort of a, uh, some wishful thinking involved, therefore, is because so many people were making such good money off of business with Russia, it was kind of um, easy for them to convince themselves that if we just left Putin alone, he'd leave us alone. Um, have any of Russia's allies spoken out yet? And if so, what stances they are taking? Russia doesn't have a lot of allies in the formal sense of an alliance like NATO, um, but let me just go over what a couple of countries have done. Belarus, who we used to think of as, as sort of aligned with Russia, but I think really now has been taken over by Russia, um, is basically part of the invading force. It's not only the staging ground for the invading force uh, north of Ukraine coming down, uh, especially towards Kiev and some other cities, but from what we can tell, uh, Belarusian military units are actually taking part. So Belarus has actually, again, more or less been taken over by Russia. So it's a participant 
China has, has had a, a very careful line, which is it hasn't directly criticized Russia, but it also has talked about um, its insistence on respecting other countries' sovereignty. What it has said most recently that I've been able to, to find and read is, uh, we hope the two countries come to a negotiated solution because we believe in sovereignty. So not directly criticizing Russia, uh, but also kind of hinting that it's not really keen on this. Um, India has been actually, I think, the most interesting question because India, um, um, actually, is, uh, uh, the leader of India has had a meeting with Putin, um, and some Indian officials have come out saying actually fairly supportive things about Russia. I mean, it's, this is because India over the years has had a somewhat um, valuable relationship with Russia, uh, partly economically, but more importantly in terms of um, getting uh, uh, weapon supplies from Russia. Russia has reassured, apparently, from what I read, re reassured India that the missile systems it was planning to develop to, uh, to deploy to India, or sell to India, I should say, are still going to be sold. And um, I read a, a tweet from one Indian official, um, a, a minister in the Indian government, that basically said um, you know, to Ukraine and to the West, you know, you haven't supported us against this, you haven't supported us against that, referring to Ukraine, saying you sold weapons to Pakistan, who plans to use them against us, and now you're asking for our help. Uh, so there's been this sort of sense, I think, of uh, in India that Ukraine hasn't been a friend to India um, and that the West hasn't been friendly enough to India. So basically saying we'll side uh, with, with India. Some of the other countries that are involved in agreements with Russia, like Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, countries of Central Asia, um, to be honest, I haven't had a chance yet to, um, to see exactly what they've said. I'm not sure how important it is. My guess is what they're really trying to do is, is lay low and, and not get involved. Um, so there's a bunch of questions about sanctions, and we could talk about sanctions for hours, but I'm not going to do that to you. Um, so the EU uh, and the United States have announced sanctions on Putin. How, how would that work? Well, there's a couple of different kinds of, of sanctions, so we want to be clear about them. Um, there are actually sanctions in place on Putin. Putin has you know, skimmed off and stolen a lot of money over the years, and we don't know exactly where it is, but a lot of it is presumably in, in uh, bank accounts around the world. And so there is direct economic sanctions, essentially, to try to freeze the assets of Putin and other uh, specifically named leaders in the Russian um, government. This is a policy that's called smart sanctions, and it's good marketing, I guess, to call it that. The idea is not to target an entire economy and make people suffer who've had nothing to do with uh, a war, but to target um, the leaders who, who benefit most. Um, so, so there are those sanctions, but there are now some broader sanctions on the Russian economy as well. So a, a, a small number of banks and then a larger number of Russian banks have basically been sanctioned in a way that they won't be able to do business with Western banks. And, and so it'll make it much harder for the Russian firms that rely on those banks um, to have access to Western banking services. So that'll, that'll be a blow to those firms and, and indirectly then to the broader Russian economy. Um, what the West has not wanted to do is enact the kind of blanket sanctions that would hurt Russian consumers as well as, as uh, the Russian oligarchs in leadership. In my opinion, um, really the only way Russia is going to change its behavior is if the Russian people force um, Putin to change behavior um, by basically you know, forcing him out of power. And so um, sanctions that don't really put any pain on the, on the Russian people, I'm afraid, are, are much less likely to be effective. The hope of these kinds of sanctions, frankly, is that the Russian oligarchs will get tired of, of uh, Putin costing them money and we'll do something about it. But I think that's uh, pretty unlikely. <clears throat> to the, uh, and to be clear, none of this will happen in the short term. By the time any of these sanctions really bite and cause pain, uh, the war in Ukraine, you know, uh, the, the, at, least, the, at least the sort of active part of the Ukrainian uh, army being, uh, uh, I'm afraid, destroyed by the Russian army will be long over. Rather, the importance of sanctions is in the long term, which is in the long term, they're going to depress the growth rate of the Russian economy. And in the long term, military power, lots of kinds of power, um, and the legitimacy, legitimacy of the government depend on economic performance. And so I think, this is where I think is the real weak part in Russia and what Russia is doing, is in the long term, relative to China, which is a big country, very close to China, relative to the United States, relative to a lot of countries, um, the Russian economy is going to grow more slowly, and hence the, the wealth gap between Russia and the rest of the world is just going to grow and grow and grow. And in one sense, that was one of the roots that, that was uh, uh, underlying the collapse of the Soviet Union. So in the long term, I think Putin's creating some, some real problems for Russia. Um, will, the Russia, will Russia and its allies sanction us back? I'm not sure Russia's allies will, but Russia will sanction, will, will sanction us back. Um, and, and this is where the situation gets really weird, because the biggest thing we could do, or the Western Europe could do, <coughs> to put pressure on Russia, 
<clears throat> would be to stop buying gas from Russia. And the biggest thing that Russia could do um, to hurt Western Europe would be to stop buying, ga uh, stop sending gas to Western Europe. But Western Europe is hugely uh, dependent on Russian gas, and Russia's economy is hugely dependent on uh, the revenue that comes back. It's a huge part of the Russian uh, government revenue and a huge part of the Russian economy. So as mad as the West is at Russia and as defiant as Russia is, uh, at least in the short term, it looks like they're going to try to keep this, this energy trade um, going. There will be some more minor sanctions that, that won't have much of an impact on anybody. There's nobody who's really too dependent on uh, exports from Russia, with one important exception. Um, and that is there is an element called palladium, which goes in the catalytic converter of automobiles, and Russia uh, basically is the source of almost all the palladium in the world. So there are going to be some supply chain issues that do come out of this. Um, do, I, um, do I think that um, Russia would invade NATO members, um, or would the repercussions be a deterrent? I don't think Russia will invade NATO members, but I didn't think Russia would do this either. And so um, there are three NATO members, <coughs> Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia, and, and you can get a, ma a map and, and look at where they are. And basically what you'll see is they sort of stick like a thumb away from the main part of Western Europe and have a, a small border with the rest of Western Europe and a longer border with Russia. Um, and NATO has not deployed a lot of forces to those states, in part because NATO didn't want to provoke or annoy or, or uh, um, you know, anger Russia. Russia could, uh, mili from a military perspective, Russia could conquer those armies or in those territories very, very quickly. That would leave the West in the dilemma. Um, do we go to nuclear war with Russia over these very small territories? Or do we say, well, I know we've got this NATO alliance which says an attack on one of us is an attack on all of us, but guess what? We're really not going to do it because, because we, don't want to, uh, we don't want to go to nuclear war over Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia. So um, I don't think Putin will do that because he doesn't want to risk a nuclear war with the West. Um, but if he really wanted to take a knock at NATO, that's what he would do because it would put NATO in a position potentially of saying, we're not going to do the things we've said we're going to do. And that would really um, potentially be a fatal blow to NATO. And that was a problem we created when we expanded NATO um, to these countries without really putting the military means in place to, um, to, to stop a Russian invasion. And I should say that this question of can we stop a Russian invasion or do we rely on nuclear retaliation, which some people felt wasn't a really credible threat, uh, that's a dilemma we faced um, for most of the Cold War as well. And a lot of the Cold War diplomacy was about trying to keep that threat credible. Um, in a Security Council statement, Putin implied that any country that intervenes would face harm, like he said, like, like, like no country has ever seen before. Um, and the question is, is a nuclear threat imminent? Well, I would say, in some sense, the nuclear threat is already there, right? Um, it's there because they have the nuclear weapons, the United States has nuclear weapons, France and, and Britain have nuclear weapons. The threat's always out there, which is if you do, if you go too far, um, somebody might do something, uh, um, somebody might launch a nuclear weapon. Um, or, or as um, the fear, especially in the Cold War was, when you're in a crisis, things get crazy, mistakes happen, you could have an accidental launch of a nuclear weapon uh, that would start World War III. Um, but so, so the threat is always there, but clearly Putin is trying to say, <clears throat> I think what he's trying to say is, not only should you not get involved in this war directly, which he knows we're not going to do, but I think what he's really trying to, to, to do is to try to get us to think twice um, about supplying weapons to Ukraine or maybe about supplying uh, an insurgency in Ukraine if that's what develops. He's basically trying to say, don't, don't, don't get involved. We're going to do this. Stay out. And of course, from the perspective of the West, there's always this idea of, well, we don't think that if we supply the Ukrainians, Putin is going to nuke Washington, D.C., but he wants us thinking about it, right? He wants us worried, of, just like we want him worried, he wants us worried about the idea that this could escalate to a place that's just not worth it to us. Do I believe that um, NATO blocking Ukraine from joining would open up peace talks, um, or have we already passed that point? Um, we've already passed that point. Um, Putin is, has his own way of making sure that Ukraine doesn't join NATO, and the answer is he's going to integrate Ukraine into Russia, or he's going to take it over and install a puppet government that's, um, that's controlled from Moscow. Uh, 
Um, he basically, uh, what, what it seems is, he gave up waiting for those kind of guarantees, and he's going to create his own guarantee. So I think we're done with that. Um, there's a question about cyber attacks over actually um, 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 putting soldiers on the ground, dispensing soldiers. Um, Obviously, what's going on in Ukraine is the old kind of warfare. I mean, it looks a lot like World War II, except you know there are missiles involved that didn't really exist in the same form in World War II. But it's rolling tanks in, it's rolling soldiers in, it's taking territory. Um, cyber, cyber warfare supports that. Um, all kinds of cyber attack on Ukrainian entities. Um, I, I think what maybe the question is getting at is, is, is it possible that the United States <coughs> will try to do some cyber war on <clears throat> on Russia as a way of um, of doing something, a non-military retaliation. And that's very possible, but I actually think the United States is, so far at least, considers itself to be deterred from even doing that. And at the same time, we haven't seen a lot of new Russian cyber attacks on the United States. I think both sides are trying to hold back from that um, because they both probably can do a lot of, of damage to the other. But the broader question is, yes, yeah, cyber attacks are a big part of this. And I suspect going forward, um, when a lot of Ukrainians are displaced from Ukraine and in other places, Ukraine has, uh, has some pretty good hackers as well. And I suspect we'll probably see some long-term hacking uh, efforts um, aimed at Russia. Uh, is it significant that Sweden and Finland uh, attended the NATO summit this week? Um, does that imply that Sweden and Finland have an interest in joining NATO? The answer is it does. Um, it is very, I, I think this is a very astute question. Um, and it's, it's an irony because uh, you know, one of the things that Putin has complained about is the enlargement of NATO and the role of NATO and so on. And it's certainly true that NATO added uh, uh, a lot of new members since the end of the Cold War. It's equally true that NATO was in a lot of ways um, eroding away. All the members of NATO were spending less money on their military. The United States was focused on Iraq and Afghanistan. So the alliance had expanded but was becoming less and less substantive. Um, and, and, and what now Putin has done has guaranteed that uh, NATO is going to beef itself up to something much more like it was during the Cold War. And on top of that, Sweden, which had always been a neutral country um, going all the way back to uh, you know the early 20th century, and Finland which has had a very interesting relationship with Russia over the years, they clearly now, it looks like, are scared into wanting to have some kind of relationship with NATO. So in that sense, what Russia has done is going to clearly be counterproductive from the reasons it says it wants to do this, but I'm not sure fear of NATO was ever really what was driving this to begin with because NATO poses no real threat to Russia, and, and, and Russia knows this. Um, I think this is much more about exactly what it looks like, which is Putin really wants to control so um, those are the questions that were put to me, but I'm going to throw one more question out there, which is, um, what happens now? Um, and of course, just to be clear, I'm speaking Friday morning, the 25th of February. This could all change within the next hours or days. But what I see, at least at the moment, is the big question that we have is, um, how much of Ukraine's territory does Russia try to seize? Does it try to seize it all, or, or does it leave some of Western Ukraine, which is the most anti-Russian part of Ukraine? Does it say it's not worth it for us? Um, do, does it, does it um, what happens to the government of Ukraine? Do they get killed? Do they get captured by the Russians? Or do they escape to form some kind of government in exile? But I think the big question really is, with whatever territory Russia has captured, how does it try to govern it and... Um, and, and how does it succeed in doing so? Um, we have to believe that some Ukrainians are going to resist. But uh, and, uh, the big question is um, how many and to what extent, and to what extent does it become very difficult for, for, um, for Russia to actually govern the country? One possible outcome that a lot of people have pointed to is a, an Iraq, Afghanistan style um, insurgency that, that could go on for years and eventually. Uh, um, create a lot of casualties for Russia. Um, I would point out that Russia has a way of dealing with insurgencies that the United States didn't, which is to say for all the uh, innocent people who were killed in Iraq and Afghanistan, um, the United States was trying not to kill innocent people, and, and, and Russia historically has not always done that. Um, so so it, it could be a very much nastier anti-insurgency campaign. Um,
But that's, those are really the questions now. The question is, it's, it's, as the United States found out in Iraq, it's fairly easy to defeat a smaller army. Um, governing a country of people who do not want to be governed um, is a much trickier proposition. Um, so that's where we um, stand right now, again, as of about 9 o'clock Pacific time on the uh, 25th of February. Um, as this goes forward, um, I'll try to uh, create some more um, videos, and uh, if there are more questions that people want to put to me, um, you know, I think it's pretty easy to find me. Um, so there we are. Thank you.